Well, very warm greetings to you, whoever you are, <laughs> wherever you are. Uh, Michael Cassidy here, talking to you from my study in Hilton Hotel, South Africa. I've been asked in this little sharing to talk about the subject of the politics of love, which is actually the title of a book I wrote a good many years ago. Um, and it's, it's a theme which I believe is extremely important anywhere in the world, but certainly here in South Africa. In 1987, the sayings of school children of all races and backgrounds were collected and put in a little book. And the title of that book was I want love in South Africa. This was written by a young African girl and they thought it was so striking that they took it as a title for the book. Why would a child say that? Well, presumably because a child felt that love was absent in South Africa. <clears throat> Why? Well, because she felt that what was happening to her, to her parents, to her family, friends, was not loving. It was unkind. It was unjust. Children particularly have a very acute sense of justice. And she felt that these injustices inflicted horrible things on them and that they weren't motivated by love. Actually, everybody wants to know love and everyone in South Africa certainly wants to know love in this country. That little child was experiencing injustice. In my mind, justice is love built into structures. So injustice speaks about structures where love is absent. Thought for the other person is absent. And in the old days, I used to say to some of the apartheid National Party politicians, for example, Dr. Pete Kornoff, whom I knew quite well, and who was a strongly professing Christian. But I said to him, and I wrote in one of my books that I gave him, not one of you in the National Party cabinet would want to be on the receiving end of apartheid. You would not want to have those experiences which people have who are on the other side of this racial divide. And I think that love puts some key questions uh, before us. And I want to share, think about some of these at the moment. They become very clear if you think of the apartheid context specifically. Um, but it takes me back to a great man who was around South Africa in the early years of my ministry, probably wouldn't mean much to many of you now, um, because that was a good few years ago. It takes me back. Um, his name was Edgar Brooks. He was a parliamentarian. He was a representing blacks in Parliament and the old dispensation. He was a deep academic historian, lecturer, also in Natal University, a Liberal Party leader with Alan Payton and Peter Brown and others. And he was the first chair also of African Enterprise South Africa. Edgar influenced me greatly. 
And Edgar said, love is a political virtue. He said, the world languishes because love is being tried so little. <clears throat> it is imperative that it should be admitted into the field of political thought. That's a powerful statement. It's imperative that love be admitted into the field of political thought. St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, love never fails. That's true in personal life. It's true between husband and wife, parents and children, peers and peers. And it's also true in society and in government. It doesn't fail. It's easy to illustrate this, actually, if you, if you think back to the apartheid era where everything was in stark contrast and we have, we have thankfully come a long way now, but, but I'm just illustrating my point. You see, would love want to have humanity and human beings offended and wounded constantly by separate schools, separate toilets, uh, separate entrances to post offices, <clears throat> separate train carriages, separate places of residence. Would love really want that? Would love want husband and wife to be required to live separately as migrant labor did for 10 or 11 months of the year? Is that a love requirement? Husbands to be separated all that time from their families? Would love want you to be forbidden to marry the woman you loved if she was of another race? Would love be okay with your children getting lower level education? Would love want to prevent Basil D'Oliveira, a colored cricketer, playing cricket for South Africa? has happened. The point's obvious. What was required was not to tell black people, look, the Lord loves you. The Lord will undertake for you. The Lord will just take care of you if you seek his help. No, what was required was some strokes of a loving, legal, legislative pen, motivated by love and justice to put an end to the apartheid era. You can think of it in other simpler terms. For example, if there is a crossroads in a town where there are constant accidents that produce death and bereavement and pain and sadness, the solution is not to say people should really drive more carefully there. <laughs> the solution is to put in some traffic lights. That's a structural change at that crossroads required by love because you want to stop all the accidents and the sadness and the bereavement. So those are the, the sorts of questions that love asks and actions that love requires. I think myself also that there are <clears throat> some what I call laws, love's laws, you might say, uh, in politics. I've itemized a few in my own mind. The first law, law one, love sees politics as all about people. First of all, the politicians themselves are people, ordinary people who love, fear, think, hate, worship. That's what, that's what people do. And 
those that's that's the politicians but then out there in the country there are all these people human beings born in the image of god and it's so important i believe in the political arena that we don't just think as beings but we think as human beings in other words what does it mean to be a human and what does it think mean to think humanly and in humanitarian terms out of being a human being what does it require of us what laws what actions what effects on other people will our actions and our laws produce a second law says that love deals with its own heart first. Tolstoy, the great Russian writer, and actually I've had the privilege of going into his old home there in Moscow some years ago when I visited there with my wife. Tolstoy said, everyone thinks of changing humanity, but no one thinks of changing themselves. And this is a very great ch challenge, I believe, always in those times and certainly in these. I read a book uh, way back when, mid-80s, called The Passing Summer. And in that book I wrote this, What is allowed to conquer each heart will conquer the country. If hatred conquers my heart, I must not be surprised if it conquers South Africa. If bigotry and prejudice conquer your heart, they will conquer in your country, wherever you are. If despair and defeatism rule in your heart and mind, they will rule in the citadels of the land and prevail in its policies. And will, we will reap the fruit in full measure. So how can that be? Well, it's because... If you conquer in the microcosm of your own attitude to an individual, you are then free to conquer in the macrocosm of the group. Many years ago, I met a, a Jewish Christian, Paul Ostreicher, whose father had been terribly, terribly damaged and hurt in Nazi Germany in all that dreadful time of the Holocaust. And he said to his son, Paul, while talking about this, because Paul was saying, you know, don't you want vengeance on those Nazis and all of that? And his father said to him, I can never face Hitler without seeing the Hitler in myself. That's powerful. Oh, in other, in other words, I've got to deal with my own self, my own heart. And of course, I really do believe the gospel comes in here because our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit, speaks into our hearts, changes our hearts, convicts us in our hearts of sinfulness. And if our hearts receive that, and if our hearts are repentant rather than being stubborn, then we are on the way to seeing significant change in the wider context. Thirdly, in the third love, law three, love loves, humanizes, and forgives its enemy. South Africa specializes actually in enemies. Everybody as someone else's enemy. Certainly that was true in the path, past, although probably somewhat better now, but we're pretty good at having enemies. And almost nowhere are people rising to the heights of Martin Luther King, who once said to Southern whites, do to us what you will, and we will still love you. <laughs> How about that? I once met his wife, 
Coretta Scott King and what a lady she was and was inspiring to hear her talk about Martin Luther King and the love he manifested. The other thing love does with the enemy is it humanizes the enemy. When we had those Kalebi Lodge retreat and dialogue weekends in uh, 1993, mainly, and we had we had we took politicians away, clusters of fifteen or twenty, ninety-two in all over six dialogue weekends. We took them away to the bush, to an upmarket facility, and the only agenda was that really to share our hearts, and to share our vision for a new South Africa and the steps to get there. But you know, one of the things we did was to ask people to share their autobiographies. And as people heard their enemy, their political enemy, because we had people from the far left to the far right, from the people who said one white man, one settler, one bullet, to those who said give us a million guns and we'll solve the problem. We had all of those people, that spectrum, in those meetings. And as people shared their autobiographies, they... they the listeners found themselves humanizing that enemy, seeing the human being in them, allowing stereotypes to be broken, allowing mythologies to be exploded. I remember being quite touched by Albie Sachs, whom I met once. He, he uh, landed up the end of his career and that a part of his career in the Constitutional Court. And he, he'd had his right arm blown off by a letter bomb and the South African Dirty Tricks Brigade was trying to wipe him out. Uh, didn't succeed, but it blew his arm off. And Albie Sachs once wrote, I'm curious to meet the people who planted the bomb and talk to them. I can't bear the idea of this cold assassination. I want to push a kind of humanity right in front of them so that I become transformed from just a target to be eliminated into a human being. Imagine that. That's a pretty amazing ask, as you might say. Also, I want to say that love forgives. Kenyatta, Jomo Kenyatta, he said, we can never build a new Kenya unless we build it on forgiveness. And Mandela is a classic illustration, maybe in all the history of politics, or certainly of our politics, when he said he had, to, after 27 years in imprisonment, to come out and say, we blacks must forgive whites. And he set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission when freedom would be granted an amnesty on the basis of sharing truth. And he chose that instead of Nuremberg trials, which would have sent South Africa into an incredible tailspin of blow and counter blow spiraling down finally into civil war. Now he chose something different, the way of forgiveness. <coughs> Abraham Lincoln, very interestingly one time, said, don't waste time getting even. The only way to destroy your enemy is to make him your friend. To get even with your enemy is to set his enmity in concrete and keep you forever apart. If you get even with your enemy, you will set his enmity in concrete and keep you apart. But enemy love, the Bible talks and Jesus talked a lot about loving enemies. Enemy love embraces the principle 
that you so resist your enemy in love that you not only change the situation, <laughs> but you change and transform your enemy. That's the way through. Finally, law four, love hears and sees the other side. St. Augustine, the great early church father, had a saying that he, he preached a lot. Audi alteram partem means hear the other side. Hear the other side. That again, coming back to Colobi Lodge weekends, and political enemies heard the other side. That was what was so significant. And towards the end of the, of the National Party government, numbers of its leaders, including Leon Vessels, who was a wonderful man whom I knew, a National Party member of parliament, he said, if only we had talked to the ANC sooner, if only we had heard the other side sooner, it would have made a great difference. That power of dialogue, nothing happens till people meet. So let me conclude. Much of what I've said right now shows that the heart is key. Jesus said everything comes from the heart. All the rubbish, the nonsense, the awful stuff comes from the heart. But also from the heart can come. If the Lord is in our hearts and the Holy Spirit is working, then the fruit of the Spirit in our hearts is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, or self-control. That's a fruit of the Spirit working in the heart. And that's, that's why I believe, dear ones out there, whoever you are and whenever you hear this, you may hear it many years from now for all I know, when I'm six feet under the sun. <laughs> but all I do know is that what we need in this country is a transformational revival where the spirit of love is let loose in our country as never before. And the great model that I always lift to people out of history is the great Wesleyan revival at the end of the 18th, early 19th century. It began with prayer, preaching, teaching, discipleship. Love was let loose in the nation. And not just amongst the people at the bottom of the pile. It reached up to Parliament. And Wilberforce, for example, he preached and cried out for the end of slavery out of a heart of love in that parliament for over 30 years until finally in 1832, slavery was abolished. Lord Shaftesbury, it was out of love when he saw what was happening to children working down the mines, 84,000 of them, pretty much naked most of the time, 18 hours a day. Love made him cry out against that and it led to reform. And so the love that was released in British society at that time led to structural change, structural reform. It, it, it led to reform in medicine, reform in education, it led to reform in the prisons. It led to reform in the mines. And it led to the abolition of slavery. And it's that kind of revival we need now where love drives us in South Africa to do all sorts of things which will change our country for the good, which will face unemployment in new ways and joblessness which will face a scourge of child and women abuse, which will, which will bring an end to the corruption 
that keeps much needed money from the people where the real needs are. Love will bring our crime rate down, one of the very highest in the world. Our child and women abuse and rape rate is the highest, I believe, in the world. Our accident rate on our roads, the way we drive, is actually a moral and spiritual issue. The highest accident rate, I believe, in the world as well. So, dear ones, you see, Edgar Brooks, I believe, was right when he said love is a political virtue and it is imperative that love should be admitted into the field of political thought. Imperative that love be admitted into the field of political thought and that it bring about structural and other types of change in our country. So perhaps I leave you with a prayer thought that God would make, would, would, would baptize our nation with love afresh and bring the change that we long for and the healing and make South Africa, which I believe it really can be, could be and should be, a shining light for Christ <laughs> to the nations. The Lord bless you, dear ones, as you think about this. Bye for now.